you talked about earlier, David, about the, having that spiritual, physical, mental, and financial square uh, in a balanced uh, part of our lives. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, and, and I think that's that's really why this is so so it's so it's so fitting that you would be able to to talk intelligently about these areas and how they all fit in. Yes. All right. All right, so first of all, first question, I mean, how we want to get this all started, and, and as we agreed, we'll just go back and forth, and uh, hopefully, folks, you can type in your questions as we go along, and then we'll try to, to treat this uh, as, as, as best as possible. The first question, obviously, is uh, why is it so important for people to have um, some degree of financial literacy? Well, uh, like you said, uh, David, it's just part of the overall picture of our spiritual, physical, and mental side. In fact, David, I was going to tell you that um, occasionally I get lower back pain, but it's not because I'm stressed out. It's because I've been playing too much golf. <laughs> so I got to be too. <laughs> yeah, I got to be careful. If you don't swing the golf club just right, you can give you a little bit lower back pain. <laughs> that is true. That is true. <laughs> uh, but you know, uh, that is so. Uh, that is uh, correct. Is that Stress is really the symptom of something that is not going right uh, in our in our lives, and so the the manifestation of uh, doing something incorrectly or not enough or too much, the symptom is the stress or the anxiety or frustration that uh, we all have experienced from time to time, which is Mother Nature telling us that we need to back up and take a closer look at some of the things we're doing or not doing. Now, when I give uh, my financial seminars, I typically lead out with this question um, to the audience, and that is, of the three major resources that we are given in life, uh, those three major resources are the, our time, our health, and our money. And I then ask the audience, of those three major resources, which one is the most important? And I'll get uh, answers on all three of them. Someone will raise their hand and say, oh, my gosh, it's time. You've got to have time. Other, some, someone else will say, no, 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 health. Health is everything. You, that is the most important major resource. And then, of course, some will say, oh, no, money. Because without money, you, you can't afford good health, and you can't afford to do the things you want to do with your time, and so forth. And they're all sincere um, answers. And then once uh, I get the audience thinking, I say, well, the, the most important uh, of these three major resources in your life is the one that you have the least amount of. <laughs> right? Because, yeah, it's the one you have the least amount of. I have uh, coached uh, people over the last three decades. I'm thinking of one fellow in particular who passed away about, oh, 15 years ago or so. And when I was working with him, um, he, had, he was a multimillionaire had all the money in the world. And uh, he was about 70 years old at the time and uh, still working hard. He was kind of a workaholic, and, and he saved his money like crazy. And so at age 70, he was still working hard. Um, and unfortunately, one of the reasons why he worked hard is because he alienated so many people in his life, including his uh, children and, and grandchildren and, and, and uh, other family members, that he just uh, uh, went to his work uh, as a way to escape uh, some other uh -huh. things. And so in the, in the course, and with me helping him manage his money, he was a multimillionaire. Well, the, the time came in his life where his health got worse and worse and worse because he was, he, uh, over the decades, he ate too much fast food for lunch, et cetera. Uh, he was, mm -hmm. uh, uh, didn't have good health. And eventually, um, he passed away. And I've thought about his case uh, or his situation over the years, and he had a very lovely, lovely um, uh, supportive wife. Uh, one Christmas, he bought brand new computers for each of his children and grandchildren, which was 33 in number. So you take 33 oh, wow. brand new computers and printers, and you, and you put that out into the marketplace, you can see the kind of money he had, and he and he was very happy that one Christmas uh, to buy everybody in his family a new computer and printer. Uh, but eventually, 
he did pass away, uh, not taking care of himself health-wise, and of course his uh, family ended up fighting over the millions of dollars that he left behind. So uh, a, a good person, uh, a big heart, uh, but just did not manage his three major resources in a balanced way to enjoy the quality of his life. And he, he passed away at about 72 years old. So he wasn't too happy when he, 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 he was still married, though. Oh, yes. Yes, and I worked with his widow. Uh, uh, when he passed away, uh, we, uh, I worked with his widow, and then eventually uh, the, the children, because, uh, oh, about five years later, she passed on, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's, I, I, I think, David, I, don't, I, I haven't kept the exact count, but I believe in the last 30 years, uh, I have uh, coached and did personal counseling, uh, uh, money management counseling, uh, financial planning counseling with well over 800 families in about uh, 35 states in America and about four of the 13 provinces in uh, Canada. And, oh, wow. uh, and so I've got clients of all race, creed, color, religion, uh, gender, etc. Um, and, you know, um, with all the diversity that we have uh, in the world, I even have uh, clients uh, in Europe and uh, Australia now, um, everybody has some common interests. And that is, here's the common denominator, David, that it is quality of life. I don't know of anybody I've ever worked with who ultimately wants to have time and good health and money so that they can have quality of life. That's the common denominator of all the people uh, that uh, that uh, uh, live in various countries and states and provinces. So yeah, and that makes sense. Yeah. That makes sense. Now, most of our guests today are probably listening and may probably not be in the position as your the millionaire who 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 passed away at 72. Now there are will be people who are pretty much not sure what to do with the meager income that is coming in. I'm not saying all of them on our call uh, in that yeah. position, but yeah. How about people who are struggling? I mean, who are basically struggling and trying to make ends meet. Yeah. Uh, how well, are there some general principles that will that they can begin to apply? And obviously, I know that I'm I'm trying I'm casting a big net now. Yeah. But, uh, uh, you've probably seen from the 800 people that you've worked with um, quite a few people who are not well off. I mean, you gave a couple of examples right. in your interview earlier on. Uh, yeah, and that, in fact, let me, uh, let me give you that example that uh, we talked about in the past, David. And uh, um, I, had, uh, I worked with a, a couple for many years. Uh, he, was, he was a blue collar uh, employed uh, with a company here. Um, and um, and he happened to live uh, here in the Western United States, and he spent about 35 years with this company, and he loved his job, and he had a pension, um, a small uh, pension, and he had a little bit of a 401k, and um, and he retired, and I helped him through that, and then about oh golly, eight, ten years into retirement, uh, he took ill, and um, and then after a year or two, passed away. And uh, so I continued to work with his widow, and uh, she called me up one day a couple years after he had passed away and, and said, uh, you know, I, I need your help. And I said, okay, how can I help? And she said, well, you know, I'm pretty much just getting my Social Security check because my husband's pension stopped when he passed away. It was just a, a it wasn't a joint pension. It was just a, a full survivor pension, I mean, a, a full uh, pension. Uh, maximum payout, and she said, "I'm I'm making about twelve hundred dollars in Social Security each month, and well, I'm only spending a thousand, and I just I don't know what to do with the other two hundred dollars." And I and and her sincerity was was clearly in place, and I said, "Well, let's see, um, what do you want to do with the other two hundred dollars that's left over at the end of the month?" And she mentioned some things about sharing money with some uh, other people and so forth. And so um, she lived uh, on that amount of Social Security for, for uh, uh, many years, and, and she has since passed away too. 
but it, it, it was a, a, a an interesting comparison to my multi millionaire multi millionaire friend Doug, and then and then her situation um, where she was such a good money manager, and they had lived within their means all these married years. I think they're married like sixty years or something, uh, to where even on a small amount of Social Security, she still had money left over. So here, here, here's the point, David, is that it's not how much money a person makes, it's what they keep. It's not what a person makes, it's what they keep. And so uh, sometimes we all, in a sense, like to fantasize that, golly, if I, if I was as rich as Donald Trump or if I won the lottery, or if I uh, uh, has much money as my former brother-in-law, et cetera, uh, I would be happy. Uh, not so. Not so. In fact, in many cases, having more money typically makes life more complicated and more stressful. In most cases, it's been my experience. Um, and so uh, the key to financial security, and that's important, an important term, financial security is simply living within your means. Now, whatever that means might be, whatever that um, uh, uh, inflow is each month to uh, a person's household, if they live within their means, they will be financially secure. Isn't that encouraging? Isn't that great that that, that mm -hmm. can be the case? Right, right, right. But the question will, will, will arise. Um, some people will say, well, I understand that. I understand that, but what if, I mean, I'm, I'm not spending anything, I don't want to spend any, I'm not spending money on any, anything extra, extravagant, but I still, I have all these, I have four kids, I have five kids, I've yeah. got this though and that though, I'm overwhelmed, I can't make it, I can't yeah. make it from month to month, and a lot of people like that, I would, I would venture to say that very few people are like that widow who didn't know what to do with the extra money. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> most people know what to do with the extra. Food. If that's all they have extra money, they know what to do with it. I mean, what questions would you ask to find holes in the way they are looking at money and how, the way they are spending money? Maybe it's true that they are not living, they are not really not living within their means, but they don't know that. How will we find that out, and how will we help them better understand how to use their money wisely? Yes. Uh, one of the first questions uh, I ask is when I sit down or talk with clients over the phone, I, I've got many clients around the country and in Canada who I've never even seen. We've just talked over the phone uh, these many years, and um, we have voice recognition but not uh, an image recognition. So um, one of the first questions I ask people um, who are working with me is, what is important to you financially? What do you want to accomplish? What are your objectives? And, you know, as many people and personalities they, there are out there, uh, a lot of folks uh, have the same answer, but then everyone has a bit of a different answer. A lot of people want to retire uh, uh, financially secure. Uh, most people want to uh, be able to afford um, a, a vacation or being generous uh, with uh, family members at birthdays and holidays. Uh, most people want to be able to travel a bit as they as they get older. Most people want to drive a comfortable car and live in a comfortable home. So these are common denominators that most people uh, would like to have, which fits into their quality of life. But then uh, uh, everyone has a uniqueness in their particular situation um, because some people want to um, uh, donate to a certain charity. Some people want to volunteer time. Uh, in, with a certain organization that other people would not have an interest at all. Other people would like to um, uh, travel to different areas and serve people in third world countries uh, and so forth. So um, uh, the most important thing for a person financially is what they think is important. And from that, uh, I can start to counsel and to give them some ideas of basically how realistic um, uh, those important things are to them. Can I give you another example? Yes, please. That was oh, okay. I was uh, working. This was many years ago. I was working with a an, an older um, 
a lady, a widow, uh, in Truth or Consequences, New Mexico. Have you ever heard of Truth and Consequences, New Mexico? <laughs> Is that actually a town? That, that's actually a town and in southern uh, New Mexico. And so um, anyway, as we got started, and I said, well, what's important? Uh, she started to tell me, well, I want to uh, spend money on my kids, my grandkids. I want to travel. I want to give to this uh, charitable organization. I want to be more generous to my church. I want to um, uh, add on to my home. I want to um, buy a new car. And she was going on and on and on. And I was making uh, notes very diligently. And when she got down with her list of all oh, 20 things that she wanted to do, I said, OK, well, those that's wonderful. So, you know, you're energetic. And you know, here you are in your uh, early 80s and still have lots of life ahead of you. And, and so just give me an idea, give me an idea uh, about how much money uh, do you make a month uh, at this time? And she said, oh, about $2,000. Mm -hmm. And I thought, OK, well, mm -hmm. we're going to have to work on this to where we can find that balance between uh, the $2,000 a month that you have coming in uh, versus the $10,000 a month that you want to be spending on all these 20 different things that you want to do simultaneously before you before you pass away. So I always remember that experience because her sincerity was certainly there. Uh, but as a counselor and as a coach, um, I had a uh, responsibility to help her work those things through to where uh, we eventually prioritized everything and we worked on first things first, as Stephen Covey talks about. We worked on the right. first things first and we did what we could and we stretched the money as far as we could with the $2,000 a month. And, uh, you know, again, ultimately, what was she really uh, saying to me? She wanted a quality of life. Mm. She wanted quality of life. So, okay, well, I don't know if that answered your question, uh, uh, David, but uh, uh, when you, I, I get thinking of all these hundreds and hundreds of experiences that I've had over the years, and uh, they just kind of come to mind when you ask certain things. Well, I think the, your telling stories helps uh, concretize things in, in people's minds, uh, uh -huh. because uh, my, my guess would be that the prevailing wisdom is, is is that well, we can most people just kind of survive from one month to the next and hope that no major catastrophe happens to yeah. make them lose all, everything they have. But really, there isn't that any sound, comfortable position they're in mentally where they're like, okay, I'm all taken care of for the next decade or so, and and most people feel that it is not even attainable especially, again, in these economic times. Uh, yeah. So, so the, them knowing, and so we haven't really thinking much about vacation or buying gifts. They mm -hmm. just want to know how they can be secure and uh, have yeah. their needs met and not, have, not go under, so to speak. Yes. Well, and, and where you start is uh, uh, financial security, and that is living within your means. Uh, probably the most important financial uh, uh, behavior a person can have, whether they make a million dollars a year or ten thousand dollars a year, uh, the most important financial behavior is to simply live within your means. To keep track of if I make two thousand dollars in a month, how much goes to rent or mortgage, or uh, if your home is paid off, uh, so be it. That's wonderful. How much goes to car maintenance? How much is withheld uh, for uh, taxes, et cetera? How much do I spend in groceries and utilities and uh, uh, cable, TV, et cetera? And you know, uh, what I have found is that it's really easy for a person to get discouraged about their money when they don't keep track of it. But with a, a few simple techniques that I use with clients, you can just hear them over the phone say, oh, wow, this is the first time in my life that someone has really explained to me how simple this can be. I can do this. I can do this. And you can start to uh, hear uh, their confidence uh, come into their lives because 
for the one of the first times in their lives, they actually start to understand, hey, I can do this, I can live within my means, and I can afford to do things that I didn't think I could. Uh, it's wow. Yeah. So there are there are a couple of trade secrets, in other words, that people can uh, people can be informed about. Oh that yeah. That will help yeah. turn things around. Yes. Now, are, are there any you are willing to reveal on this call? Well, oh, by sure. The way, oh, it's Greg. Hold on, thought, please. Uh, I just want to mention to, to those of you just joining us, either on the phone or via the internet. Uh, again, this is the Building Strength webinars event, and we are here with Greg Kasten. Most of you received our emails. Uh, we are talking about taking control of your financial health. And uh, Greg is a 30-year veteran in the financial services industry. He's also an entrepreneur and has dealt with now, I mean, we just found out, over 800 families and individuals throughout, throughout through the years he's been practicing this. So he has had a lot of experience uh, working with people from every work of life pretty much all over, United, all over the United States, Canada, and a few countries outside uh, North America as well. So, uh, and we were just in the middle of talking about any tips uh, that you would offer to people who are probably out of control money-wise. Yeah. Uh, one, one major tip there, uh, David, that, um, that uh, I, I'm, I'm just thinking, um, I don't think I've ever had an exception to this. Uh, in all my decades of doing coaching people, I have never seen this exception, and that is everyone I've ever worked with pays too much money in taxes. <laughs> Every, I've never come across anybody who is doing everything they can to minimize their taxes. Now, that's pretty doggone encouraging, isn't it? <laughs> that is, uh, what happens is that um, the less people understand, and this is a good axiom, the less people understand about their money, the more they will pay in taxes. Huh. Now, huh. what happens if uh, someone, uh, uh, for the first time in their life, realizes that you mean I can take a deduction on that ex on expense? You sure can. Wow, I never knew that. Yeah, un unfortunately, uh, no one told you that before. Because, so that means the last 40 years, you've been paying too much taxes on such and such. Oh, no. And uh -huh. uh, yeah, uh, it's just amazing. And of course, does Uncle Sam, does the IRS, are they uh -huh. really interested in educating the population on how to minimize their taxes? I don't think so. No. I don't think quick, so. Yeah, let me give you a quick example. Um, would the IRS um, be just as satisfied if everybody filed uh, a 1040 short form every year? They would love it, wouldn't they? Right. Because there's no tax deductions. Uh, there's a few exemptions, of course, but no significant tax deductions in the 1040 short form. Well, so then why do people file a 1040 long form? And why do they file a Schedule A and a B and a C and D and so forth? Because somewhere along the line, someone educated them that if they did these extra forms, they could deduct more money from their taxes other than just filing the, the 1040 short. This, there's a quick example of people who overlook uh, the many tax deductions they could get if they would just be more educated on what they're eligible for. And that's one of the services I provide is uh, uh, walking them through uh, their tax return and things that they could do to save money. Now, here's a thought that I have told uh, clients for 30 years, David, and that's this. For every dollar that I send to Washington, D.C. in taxes is a dollar I never see again. Isn't that right? And right. for every, every dollar anybody sends to Washington, D.C., it's a dollar they never see again. It's gone. Right. It goes somewhere um, that the government chooses to use it. So 
that means that every dollar I don't send to Washington, D.C., and I leave it in my pocket, it's a dollar that I can spend or save or share with somebody. Right, right. Okay. Isn't that, isn't that a powerful concept? Reducing or reducing and minimizing taxes. Now, you notice I, I didn't say eliminate taxes, right? Right. Because, uh, because some, uh, some people, uh, uh, it's extremely difficult to totally eliminate all taxes, but certainly, certainly we are all eligible to minimize our taxes. Okay. All right. So we, we, we've talked about taxes now. Um, and I think that's really people need to be educated big time on that um, for sure. Yeah. Uh, but how other areas where, I mean, what, what are the mistakes that you see? I mean, we talk about taxes being a, a major issue you see with people on their finances. How about other areas um, in terms of savings? Uh, are there certain accounts, kind of saving accounts that you want to avoid? Are there certain kinds of uh, checking accounts? I mean, how do, are there other areas in which people can save or conserve their funds or where you see that they're losing money needlessly? Yes. A uh, couple things uh, along that line, David. Uh, the first uh, thing I'd like to mention is that one of the big mistakes people make is that they pay the butcher and the baker and the candlestick maker before they pay themselves. And I tell clients this. You make your charitable uh, donations because you want to. You pay Uncle Sam because you have to. You pay yourself because you need to, and then you live on the rest. Does that sequence make sense? Um, Say yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. we, we make our charitable contributions because we want to. Right. We pay our taxes because we have to. We um, pay ourselves from savings through savings because we need to, and then we live on the rest. Okay, so that's okay. an important, important sequence um, for um, clients and, and, and people to understand. Now, if you really want to mess up your financial life, get it rear end backwards. Do the opposite. Live on, live on what you've got, and then every year, Try to scramble to save a buck, uh, borrow to pay your taxes, and don't donate a dollar to anybody for any reason. And you will have a miserable financial life. Hmm. Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll use the word miserable. I won't say dissatisfied or frustrated or stressed out. I'll say spend, spend all your money and then try to save a buck don't pay your taxes, borrow your money to pay taxes, share uh, your money with no one, and you will have a miserable financial life. However, if you share your money with the, the charitable causes of your choice, you pay your taxes because you uh, have to, you save a little bit for that rainy day, then you live on the rest, you will be financially secure. Now, let me give you another tip um, along that line. So I said there was two things I want to mention. I was on the phone earlier today with a new client uh, uh, that was referred to me. And in the court, we're just getting started here, and, and uh, I'm poking around and finding some things out. Well, um, she said to me, you know, I've got, uh, I've got uh, this amount of money. Uh, well, in fact, uh, I'll, I'll tell you the amount and, um, uh, because you don't know who the client is. Uh, she's got $35,000 in uh, student loan, and um, she's paying 6.78% on these student loans, okay? So $35,000 in student loans at 6.78%, uh, okay? Now, in, in getting um, a snapshot of her financial picture, she also happens to have, because they just sold a home, uh, her and her husband just sold a home, and they had some equity in the home because they had the home for 15 years. 
And they currently have $60,000 in a 1% um, uh, savings account. In fact, it's actually less than 1% savings account at the local bank. But we'll just round it up to 1%, OK? Um, and she said, uh, uh, she said, what should we do? Should we keep the student loans at 6.78%? Uh, uh, that seems like a high interest rate. And I told her, I said, actually, what you're doing by uh, holding on to $35,000 in a 6.78% student loan while you've got $60,000 in the local uh, credit union getting you less than 1% interest, uh, that is what we call financial planning in reverse. Financial planning in reverse. And she goes, well, I don't think she quite, she quite what do you mean reverse? I said, that's how you get poor. You keep money in the bank less than 1% while you're paying uh, the butcher and the baker and everybody else, their interest rate at 6.78%, you're losing money. I said, the best thing you can do, I can tell right away, take 35000 of your 60000 pay off your student loans at 6.78% completely, and then with the $1,500 a month that you save on the student loan, you just simply add it back to the, uh, your savings account of saving for your next down payment on your next home. There's a real life example just happened today with a new client. She don't be scared to to give give away all that money at once. Uh, uh, okay. No, uh, you know why she's not scared to uh, take thirty five thousand of the sixty thousand uh, sitting in the credit union to pay off her student loans. Do you know Do you know why? She's not scared at all to do that. Why? Because for the first time in their life, they're working with a real financial planner who really has their best interest in mind. And they know that I'm going to be with them for the decades to come. Mm. So why would I give them crummy, bad, self-centered uh, advice? I wouldn't. Right. And what happens when people have a chance to work with somebody who is trustworthy, not just somebody who's trying to sell them a mutual fund or trying to sell them a life insurance policy or sell them a limited partnership or a piece of real estate or a new car or whatever, not, not, say, not someone who's trying to sell them something. And there's nothing nefarious or, or dishonest or illegal or fattening about salespeople, but salespeople always have an agenda. And what is their agenda? Their yeah. own agenda. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, um, as a as a a real financial planner, I don't work for a company. I don't have a four hundred one k with American Express. I'm not trying to get in a paycheck from Merrill Lynch or uh, Bank of America. I work strictly for and with my clients. And uh, as clients realize that the trust is there, and their and my advice to them is uh, readily accepted. And in in the, in light of this, she was so. You know what she said to me, uh, David, at the end of the, our conversation. She said, "Thank you for mentioning that to me, because that's what my husband and I were thinking that we should do." Mm -hmm. See, see, in their gut, and, and, they, he's, uh, and they're a smart young couple. They're about 35 years old, smart young couple. Mm -hmm. uh, in their gut, they knew that it just didn't make sense to leave all that money in a less than 1% savings account while they're paying 6.78% on a, on a loan. But they needed outside, unemotional, totally objective uh, point of view from someone like me, a trusted advisor, as to should they really do that? And I said, yeah, yeah, you should really do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You see so, how, th okay, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. So w were they the ones who first brought up the, the question, or you just looked at it uh, from your perspective and said this is what needs to be done, and then it, they, they admitted that they had thought about it themselves? 
Yes. Um, uh, you know, uh, I knew I was going, I was about ready to tell them about it in our next session. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I try to be careful and, and I don't overwhelm people. I mean, a lot of times people will come to me and I'll see 10 things they should do right now to get their financial house in order. Well, if you lay 10 things on people in the very first, you know, one or two sessions, they can feel overwhelmed and discouraged, right? right? So right. typically what I've learned over the years is that you start where people are at and you just build line upon line, precept upon precept, you give them the education. And see, we were to the point in just our first couple sessions where this young couple were starting to deduce, hmm, maybe this is not good, that what we've been doing. Let's mm -hmm. call Greg and run it by him. Well, I, I think it's what you just mentioned. I think it's very, very important that people realize. I mean, the, the difference now, and um, which, which obviously would a um, couple of other things that I, I want us to cover in this first webinar. Um, one would be for those people who are not making enough money, um, how to suggestions on how they can increase their income flow. Obviously, the. <laughs> Uh -huh. <laughs> um, you, you can't just go rob a bank or, uh, right. a lottery, or buy a lottery ticket, but there are certain things uh, that you have seen in your uh, in your experience and practice that people can do that most people are unaware of. The other thing would be uh, I, w I would like us to discuss if possible would be um, you mentioned something about a balance sheet, watching yeah. your cash flow, and yeah. basically giving people common tips on how to do that, what to watch out for, and, and all those things. And then I wanted to mention <laughs> um, that it, it doesn't seem like it costs all that much to get a financial planner or financial advisor like you. <laughs> because you're talking about the person who is uh, earning $1,200 a month, another person earning $2,000 a month. Yeah. Yeah. People would think, would think it could cost a fortune to get expert advice like yours. Yeah. Okay, well, let's, let's address that uh, uh, first there, David, in that why is, why is someone like myself so um, inexpensive to where people who are on a fixed income like Social Security or someone who um, is, um, you know, working to make ends meet at uh, $24,000 a year, uh, uh, so forth, how can they afford a financial planner like myself? Well, um, I'm uh, extremely unique. I understand that in the country, but let me tell you why uh, I'm so inexpensive. I don't uh, uh, have any overhead. My only overhead is uh, ten dollars a month for my website. Um, yeah, uh, I I don't advertise. Um, I I don't uh, I I don't have to actively um, look for new clients. Uh, and spend money on that because I've, I've got uh, great clients and I work on a referral basis. And um, the other thing is too, and I'm happy to say, uh, I work out of my home. My children are grown and gone. My three kids are all married on their own. I've got seven grandkids. And uh, they all live close by, but not in my home. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and so uh, my wife and I are empty nesters. And so I can afford to work with people on an extremely inexpensive basis because I love what I do, and I love working with the person who makes twenty-four thousand dollars a year as much as I enjoy working with the person who makes two hundred and forty thousand dollars a year. To me, wow. they're the same people. Oh, and then let me tell you, the um, the the common denominator that all my clients have, no matter what their net worth is, no matter what their um, um, earnings or their monthly cash flow is, they are all willing to be better and do better. And if, if, if I come across somebody who really isn't willing to uh, be better and do better financially, then it doesn't make any difference what uh, their net worth is nor what their cash flow is, uh, I can't really help them because ultimately I can only work with the willing. Right. And they come right. in all shapes and sizes and cash flow. Okay. 
So I wanted to mention that. Uh, now, uh, there was, uh, 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 David, uh, repeat the first part of your question, so make sure I don't go off on a tangent. Sure, sure, sure. Um, the, the first question uh, was people who desperately need to have an increased income flow. Yes, they, they're saving as much as they can. Uh, where, what suggestions would you give our viewers uh, on how to increase their income flow, their revenue? Okay, okay. Here's here's a very simple combination uh, that I tell clients uh, when they when they want more money. Uh, one. It's not what you make, it's what you keep, right? Okay. It's, it's not what you make, it's what you keep. Uh, again, example of the uh, widow uh, making $1,200 a month. Um, then um, the other important uh, point to remember um, is that if you want to have more money, you either have to increase your income and or decrease your expenses. Correct? Mm -hmm. it's, just, yes. it's just very simple. If someone wants to have more money, they either need to increase their income and or uh, decrease their expenses. And so we look at that. For some people, uh, it's easier and more doable to keep their same income and decrease their expenses. Okay? Now, for the person right next door to them, so to speak, uh, maybe it's easier and more doable for them to increase their income and not worry about decreasing their expenses. So um, it, it's easy to say if I, again, was trying to sell something or if I had an agenda to push on people, I would say, oh, the key to having more money is to increase your income, and the way you do that is by uh, buying my widget uh, my uh, CDs for only uh, uh, $999, right? Well, right. That's, that's not what I do. Uh, I look at uh, a person's situation, we deal with reality, and then I come, with, come up with ideas that they don't, they've never heard about, but maybe they've thought about, no, they haven't even thought about it. Were you aware of this, this, and this? And that is ultimately, if you want to have more money, uh, let's work on how we can increase your income and or decrease your expenses. And the net result is more money. Right. Right? Yeah. So um, now, uh, and of course, there, I, I could spend another 15 minutes on uh, things people can do to uh, make more money, and I can also spend 15 minutes on things people could do to decrease expenses. Well, we, we certainly need to have that in the next webinar that we have. Um, sure. That's also, because, uh, I mean, it, it, that, that doesn't make sense, but there are special cases where a um, person is out of a job, unemployment, for instance, and he, he, he's staring at disaster in the next three or four months when his savings runs out. Uh, and uh, and uh, in this climate, they, she's not getting, he's looking around, he's applying, he's trying to get a job. No one's, no one's accepting him. So yeah. are, there, are there things that, that such a person needs to know that could help, and obviously, uh, to uh, at least to stretch out that savings more and find out how to raise revenue? I mean, I know somewhere along the way we, we talked about having a home-based business, for example, yeah. a, a, second, a second thing to fall back on and, yeah. and how to intelligently leverage that. So those are things that we probably should uh, would would love to discuss in the, in the in in future discussions when we oh yeah get on absolutely the and that and you know David I'm a big proponent of home based businesses um, oh you are that, oh oh absolutely you know in addition to my uh, coaching and and educating and so forth my wife and I have oh I think like three different home based businesses and really? it, oh yeah it's things that we're passionate about things that we enjoy things that create value in people's lives. And did you notice I didn't say what they were, did I? No, you didn't. No, I didn't. Because what you do for a home-based business is not as important as it is does it create value in other people's lives and can you be passionate about it. See, so uh, because I've got clients, I've got a lot of clients with home-based businesses and I've got 
clients with home-based businesses all across the gamut, anywhere from, uh, um, well, if I'll name, well, I won't name uh, the names, but all the major uh, MLM companies, network marketing companies, um, uh, that involve supplemental nutritionals, uh, 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 cooking parties, toy parties, candle parties, scents, uh, oils, uh, what else, uh, educational materials, um, cosmetics, I mean, you name it, and there's a and there is a home-based business available for that person who, who can who can enjoy that certain area, huh? Right, right. Yeah. That is true. <laughs> yeah, that is yeah, so true. One of the things that when someone I work with somebody, and they say, "Oh, I really want to start a home-based business. Uh, can you help me, Greg?" And I said, "Well, let me ask you. The first question is, if you want to start a home-based business, what is one thing?" that you're really passionate about, really passionate about. And they go, hmm, wow, golly, never thought about that. No one's ever asked me that. Well, let's take a moment. What is something that you're really passionate about? And I've had someone, I've got a client who's really passionate about Corvette Stingrays. You know the old Chevy Corvette Stingrays? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Muscle cars. and. Yep. Uh, he loves, uh, uh, you know, that time frame of 1964 to 1969 Chevy Corvette Stingray models, okay. and uh, he he does very well financially by um, showing and having and buying and selling Corvette Stingrays. Hmm. Now, I wouldn't do that. I I I, I appreciate those those muscle cars. But I'm not passionate enough to have a business out of it. Right. So but it has to be is. something that a person likes. It has to be something the yeah. person loves, and and yeah. uh, not just like that the person loves, but he loves being around other people who love it. Exactly. That's another key, key to success, I, I, I would think. Oh, exactly. I mean, I've got clients who go semi-annually to their network marketing companies' uh, conventions, you know, in different parts of the country. And mm -hmm. they wouldn't miss them for the world because they love going and being around people like them every six months who have a common passion about exercise or nutrition or uh, 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 cosmetics or whatever it might be. So they, and then so once you get once they start with these home-based businesses, they've got to learn the, the, the tricks of the trade there as, as well, like the tax situations that are unique yeah. to that to that environment as well, right? Exactly. So really. Yeah. Hmm. It's a Schedule C on your tax return uh, for Americans. I um, I think it's on the T2 for the Canadians, but um, equivalent. But um, uh, uh, for us Americans, it's a Schedule C, and I call the Schedule C the eighth wonder of the world because it's the IRS's uh, gift to the taxpayer that says if you do this form correctly you will save tens of thousands of dollars in taxes over the years and, and why do I am I just guessing on that no my wife and I have been uh, filing several Schedule C's every year for the past 30 years with our businesses, and I'm happy to report that uh, my uh, Leslie and I have saved tens of thousands of dollars in taxes uh, over the years by effectively using our Schedule C's for our businesses. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. It can be done. Mm. It can be done. But you have to be willing, right? I can only work with the, with the willing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so that really brings us up to the next next point. Um, well, that's, well, you are such a wealth of information, a wealth of experience, Greg. Again, thank you so much, um, sure. folks. T type in your questions, please. Um, we have a couple more minutes. If you have any questions that you want Greg to go over, and obviously we can also send him an email too. We'll give you that information in a minute, and then um, um, because we really wanted to go over these basics these foundations, uh, I, I mean, my, my suspicion is that the vast majority of people are clearly unaware of 
of uh, what it takes to be uh, to, to to do the right things on a day to day basis, or to think intelligently where their finances are concerned, and that's why uh, we're in so much trouble trouble today. So this is so so important. So go ahead, yeah. go ahead, folks. Have me your questions. Uh, Greg, tell us how we can make and contact you if they need to have you uh, be be a client, if they need you as their coach. Sure, sure. Uh, there's no obligation in contacting me. Um, and my uh, email address is greg, G-R-E-G, -G, at financialindependencecoach, I'll, I'll repeat this, financialindependencecoach.com. Now, Financial Independence Coach is all one word. So it's Greg at financialindependencecoach.com. And of course, David, uh, they can certainly look me up on my, uh, my website, right? And that website uh, that I right. have is uh, www.financialindependencecoach.com. Pretty easy, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's easy to remember. Sure. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I know it's a long, it's all one word. Financialindependencecoach.com, but there's my that's my email, and of course that's my website, which will refer to my email too. So, um, yeah. Um, and, and like and like Greg mentioned, this is I mean he's not doing this to get more clients. I mean he he has enough as he uh, that he he wants. I mean he he can he will always. Be willing to help out with people who are willing, but again, this is not an obligation. This is this is not a. He's not trying just to advertise himself here at all. No, it's no. pretty much right. quite, quite comfortable what he's doing. Yes, yeah. yes. I've got plenty to do, but I'm always open to helping someone who is sincerely interested in being helped. Right. And right. and uh, and and they and David, as we've talked about, the clients um, um, would be astounded on how inexpensive I am, uh, and of course that's because I have no overhead. And, right. uh, and I'm extremely passionate about helping people get their arms around their financial situation, no matter what situation they're in. And right. I will tell, I will be honest with people, and if, if someone um, is in dire, dire straits, and um, uh, is in a situation that uh, needs uh, some drastic measures that would be beyond my education of, of my educating them or counseling them. I will certainly point them in the right direction if they need to, uh, uh, you know, seek out some real serious uh, uh, charitable organizations that would like to help. Them. Oh, fantastic! Fantastic! I mean, that that I'm sure that. Kind of information would be so valuable to them, to people. That's that's great. Yeah. Thank you, Greg. That would be good. Mm. And and the other thing, obviously, while we're doing these webinars, is because we we need to get you br brushed up on on your on, on your presentation skills. <laughs> oh, who me? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and get get these uh, videos and 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 putting all this wonderful experience on, uh, record all this and up. As we just, I mean, you can't, can't just have it in one place. We got the blast this kind of information around yeah. the world, right? Well, you know, and that's one thing, David. Uh, one thing uh, a person cannot be taught is experience, right? Mm. We can be taught mm. a lot of things, but there's only one way to get experience in life, and that's by experiencing life. <laughs> well, yes, and but but, Greg, I mean, a lot of the. The pitfalls that we we tend to commit could be uh, or fall into could have, could be avoided if we just had a little intelligence here from people who have gone ahead like you, right? Yeah, yeah, so. yep, yeah. Well, someone once said, uh, "Learning vicariously is a lot less painful than learning experientially." Oh, uh, you know, wiser words have never been yet been spoken. Yeah, yeah. So, and that's what I try to do. I try to give people a heads up. Um, on what they're doing and where they're heading so that they can avoid some pitfalls down the road that they don't see coming, but I would. You know, I would say, oh, my gosh, if you keep doing this, this approach to your money, do you know where you're going to end up? And I've been able to, and again, i got all kinds of stories of people I've been able to influence 
uh, when they came to me in ways that it, it uh, well, I, I hate to use this term, but I, I was involved in financially saving them from some real serious problems. Wow. Wow. Yeah, so just um, uh, there's a lot of good people out there, David, who just don't know how financial principles can be more effective in their lives. They, they just they haven't had that opportunity to learn those yet. Well, that's why that's why we have you on. Yeah. So. Okay, yeah. we have a question here. Okay. okay. Is it is it true that you can call whoever does your withdrawal from your check for taxes? That you can go to them and have them withdraw less money, so you can, you can have money to invest in your home-based business. Okay. Oh yes, uh, maybe this person's question is they're asking about their uh, uh, W-4. Uh, on if you're if if they're employed by someone with a W-2, uh, they have to submit to their employer a W-4, which says how many exemptions they claim. Okay. Now, you can claim up to, I believe, nine exemptions without having to justify that to the IRS. And so one way um, that um, I uh, coach people is that especially if they're paying too much in taxes and they're getting a refund at the end of each year, we uh, calculate it down to where um, they will get a pay raise each month by having less money withheld via their W-4. Mm. Is that what you think that question is asking? I Apparently, that's it. Joey, let us know for sure if, if this has, answers your question, OK? Let's go ahead and type something in. But I mean, from, from your answer, that may, may just be what he's asking. Yeah. Uh -huh. well, he would draw less money so you have money to invest in your home-based business, yeah? Yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's that's a technique. You bet. Um, uh, and you know you don't have to make money your first couple years in a home based business. You can have all the deductions of a home based business and take it as a loss against other income, which saves us ta saves taxes. Sometimes people think that oh my gosh, uh, I can't have a home based business because I'm not sure I can make money right away. Well, you don't. The IRS allows you to take losses in your home-based business for, I believe, the first three of the first five years if you're making a good effort to try to make money. Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people don't know that, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, I've, got a, uh, I've got a client who uh, has a farm uh, uh, back east, and um, he uh, offsets his uh, income as a professional with losses from his farm. And, um, uh, you know, it works out every year. Now, he has to eventually make some money on his farm, which he does. He makes sure he does now and then. So the IRS will be happy with him. But um, he loves his farm. And even though it doesn't make any money, he can take it on the offsetting the money he makes in his profession. Hmm. Again, oh, okay. Okay. knowing right. that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Well, he came back with uh, um, the person who asked the first question. He says, "I think that is what it is." Okay. Now the next question is, "How many except exceptions exemptions would you suggest so you are not paying some so you are not paying come tax time?" Yes. Okay. Um, what I uh, tell clients is, say for instance. Um, they get a, a $1,200 tax refund every April, okay? Um, what that tells us, that they're overpaying in taxes about $100 a month, correct? So what they, you can do, you can change your W-4 exemptions as often as you want. So I'll say, let's just say, for instance, they're claiming um, three exemptions, okay? I'll say to them, look, go in to your HR people and claim four exemptions, and then watch your paycheck and see how much more money you will have in your take-home paycheck. Okay? 
Um, and let's just say it's fifty dollars uh, a month more with uh, four exemptions. And then uh, over the course of working with them, I'll say, okay, go back and change your exemptions to five. And then let's see how much more money they will not withhold and that you'll be able to bring home an increased net. And let's just say they go to five exemptions and they take home an additional $50 a month. Uh, a simple example, I know. But can you see where this individual raises their exemptions by two and takes home an, an additional $100 a month and doesn't pay any taxes at the end of the year because it's a break even. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's a simple technique on how you can uh, not overpay your taxes and give Uncle Sam an interest-free loan for the months preceding your tax bill. <laughs> All right, um, Anita wants to know, did you say your home-based business can show a loss for only three years? I believe it's uh, uh, three of the first five years. Uh, okay, you, so you, can, you can show a loss. Now, you have to make sure that you make a, 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 a good effort in your home-based business to where it's not a hobby. See, if the IRS thinks that you're just kind of dinking around, and you, you have a hobby, um, like say for instance you like to fly fish, and so you tie oh, a dozen um, uh, fly uh, hooks, if that's the right term, a year, and you sell them for a buck a piece and you make 12 bucks, well that's not really a home-based business, right? That's right. really a hobby. Um, uh, but if you're serious about a home-based business, you can justify that to the IRS to where they have to recognize, yes, indeed, uh, you're not just a hobbyist. You're actually um, uh, uh, seriously promoting your business, and you're, making, you're losing some money, but eventually you will make money, and that's what the IRS wants. Because as you make money in a home-based business, guess what? They get, to, they get to tax some of that. So the IRS is really rooting for people to make money in their home-based business because that's how they get a little bit of revenue. All right, makes sense. Yeah. Makes sense. Now, could you, uh, I love the way you put it earlier, okay, um, uh, there were four things about this is, uh, concerning personal finances now. Um, giving to charity, giving to yourself, could you, uh, yeah. the way you put it. Okay, <laughs> you bet. Yeah, uh, you give to your charities because you want to, first priority. You pay Uncle Sam for your taxes. You pay your taxes because you have to. You pay yourself, save. You pay yourself because you want to. And then the fourth thing, you live on the rest, whatever the rest is. Okay. Whether the rest is 80% of your gross or 60% of your gross, that's an individual decision. But if you keep the three uh, priorities in track, or four priorities, you will always have enough money. And I, and I tell you uh, this, David, uh, tongue in cheek, that uh, do you know who Attila the Hun was? I do. Okay, Attila the Hun, the great conqueror. Well, mm -hmm. he wasn't a very successful conqueror until he learned the sequence of conquering. And until the Hun learned that it's plunder, then burn, not burn and plunder. <laughs> okay? So uh, when, he, when he got the sequence down correctly, it's plunder, then burn, he was much more successful as a time. <laughs> well, is, that, is, that, is that really is that, is that really? Is oh, that, no, I don't know. I, I heard that. I heard about that about 40 years ago, and it's always stuck with me. I don't know why. <laughs> but um, and but that fits into uh, the sequence, you know. Okay, well, okay buddy, but my question is: is is this should this be the person's thinking process every single month? Because I mean, almost nobody thinks about taxes every month or with the paycheck, right? Right. Well, their their taxes are withheld. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You can you can uh, have your taxes withheld 
uh, if you're an employee, of course, in FICA and FED and state and so forth. But if you're uh, self-employed like I am, you just make sure you tuck away a little bit of taxes um, that you know typically uh, you'll need to pay at the end of the cycle. Okay. So Yeah, Got so it. I, uh, and then that's, again, that's not to get too detailed, but I show clients uh, a quick and easy way to make sure that their tax taxes are taken care of if they're self-employed. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, we need to leave some some something else. Although there, there's never any uh, danger of running out of material for next next presentation, but uh, this is sure. probably a good time as any to to wrap this this segment up. Sure. Then, um, uh, I think this has been great. Greg, please. Any any final words you want to leave us with? Um, you know, I would say um, whether uh, people listening are. Uh, 20 years old or 80 years old, uh, whether you're a millionaire or um, not even close to being a millionaire, whether you make a lot of money every year or you make very little um, uh, each year, um, there's always hope that you can do better, that you can learn some things that you just don't know right now that you are eligible to learn and implement and it can save you money and it can reduce your stress and it can reduce your frustration or anxiety or your worry because the best way to stop worrying is to understand reality and when we understand how things work we gain confidence and we um, are just absolutely much less frustrated or anxious uh, I've seen it over and over again, and uh, as a as an own individual, as a uh, as a husband and a dad and a grandpa and a community member, and on and on and on, I always look for learning more things about life, about uh, my spirituality, about my health, about my money, and about how I can manage my time and priorities better. Because the more I learn, the more I'm able to get a higher quality of life. And ultimately, isn't that what we want, is a higher quality of life? I believe it is. Absolutely. 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 Okay. Well, <laughs> okay. That's, that's, that's my thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> a wonderful way to end, end it. Thank you so much again, Greg. And folks, if you want to contact Greg, his, 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 uh, his email address again is greg at financial independence. Uh, financial independence coaching. No, coach, just yeah. singular coach. coach. Financialindependencecoach.com. Yeah, that's a good way to contact him. And of course, if you have any questions for us, just shoot us an email at buildingstrengthwebinars.com, uh, info at buildingstrengthwebinars.com. This has been a great evening, folks. Thank you for joining us. Uh, be sure to stay tuned for more presentations on financial health, taking control of your financial health. Again, uh, Greg, thank you again. And uh, good night, everyone, and God bless. Yes. Thank you, David. Thank you, guys.